Hello, everyone. Um, good morning to our guests from UK and a good afternoon to our guests from India. Welcome to the first UK IBC webinar series, India's Future Insight. These webinars will take place on a regular basis and will deep dive into key sectors in India to showcase opportunities and trends. Um, in today's episode, we'll be focusing on revolutionizing infrastructure, trends and innovations. Before we begin, just a reminder that you can keep up to date with our events and important updates by following us on LinkedIn. Just search for UK India Business Council and join the 50,000 other followers with a keen interest in UK India trade and investment. You can also follow us on X as at the rate UK IBC. Today, we have expert speakers from our team who will deliver this session. Gunjan Sharma is the Associate Director of Strategy Consulting at the UK India Business Council, bringing over 16 years of unparalleled expertise in market entry advisory and business strategy. Shivra Chaudhary is a Senior Manager of Strategy Consulting at UKIBC. Renowned for his leadership skills, Shivraj has successfully orchestrated large teams of in-house consultants, senior analysts, and delivering bespoke uh, client studies that address complex consulting challenges across diverse sectors. Lastly, we have Sakshi Singh, who is a Senior Research Analyst in Strategy Consulting, she has successfully led a diverse array of market research initiatives across various industry sectors, with a particular focus on mergers and acquisitions. We have also allocated some time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers, so please feel free to type in your questions in the chat box as we go through the presentation. And towards the last 10 minutes, we'll be answering all of these questions. Uh, over to you, Gunjan. Uh, thank you, Trisha. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today from both India and the UK. I'm thrilled to welcome you to our first session of India's Future Insight series. Today's session is on the critical facets of India's infra infrastructure sector, where we talk about some of the most exciting and transformative trends shaping the future of infrastructure in India. To kick things off, let's talk about the sheer scale of investment we are witnessing in this space. The infrastructure capital expenditure for this fiscal year has reached a remarkable 133.9 billion US dollars. For the second consecutive year, India has surpassed the 100 billion dollar mark. A clear indication of the country's relentless focus on upgrading and expanding its infrastructure. This surge in capital outlay is not only laying the foundation for new highways, railways, airports, and seaports, but also revolutionizing the clean energy sector. However, the physical infrastructure is just a part of the story. What's equally critical is the development of digital and financial infrastructure, which will work in tandem to boost efficiency, sustainability, and growth. We'll be exploring how these pillars are coming together to create a robust, resilient system that will fuel India's economy for years to come. In today's session, we'll dive deep into key areas that are essential to understanding the future of Indian infrastructure, such as sustainable transportation and how it's set to change the face of mobility in the country, the advancements in clean energy, which are pushing India closer to its sustainability goals, the evolution of urban housing, where smart cities are emerging to meet the demands of a rapidly growing population. And of course, the modernization of traditional energy sectors, which are tackling the twin challenges of increasing demand and environmental responsibility. But that's not all. Today, we'll also examine the critical role of public-private partnership in infrastructure development. These partnerships are becoming vital to driving innovation, investment, and long-term growth, particularly as we move towards more sustainable, technology-driven infrastructure projects. Now, while today's webinar is focused on infrastructure, I'd like to take a moment to mention some of the exciting work happening behind the scenes here at UKIBC. Over the last two years, our team has been developing 
linear regression based predictive data models for various sectors. These tools leverage a variety of data points to forecast trends and help stakeholders make informed decisions. Apart from the infrastructure sector, we have also created in-house data models for the automotive and the housing sectors, while a model for the ag agriculture sector is currently in the works. Today, as we speak about these key topics, we hope you'll gain valuable insights, not just into the infrastructure sector, but also into how data-driven insights can shape the future of decision-making in this space. With that, let's get started. And I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Shivraj Chaudhary. We'll walk us through the key trends in infrastructure sector in India. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Gunjan. And welcome uh, all once again. Uh, move to the next slide, please. Yes, so uh, here, uh, you know, on this particular slide, we have talked uh, in more detail on the investments which are going on in the infrastructure sector, cutting across, uh, you know, transport infrastructure, energy, and the utilities. So on the left hand side in the graph number one, as you can see, from 2008 fiscal year to till 2019, which is a span of a good 10 years. India invested nearly 0 0.91 trillion US dollars in the infrastructure, cutting across transportation, energy, and social infrastructure. And if we compare these numbers on five years scale, starting from you know 2008 to 2013 five-year plan to the current one, which is running from 2020 and expected to end by the next year, which is 2025, these numbers are expected to increase by nearly 5x. And this is all because of National Infrastructure Pipeline, which aims to mobilize nearly 1.5 trillion US dollars in the infrastructure sector. Now, if we talk about some of the key initiatives which have you know, increased in, you know, investments in the transport infrastructure by uh, 2.6 times from 2020 to 2024. So Bharat Mala uh, for, for the expressways, you know, upgradation of the current railway infrastructure, which include, uh, you know, conversion from narrow to broad gauge, doubling of existing tracks, upgradation of ports under, uh, you know, Sagar Mala, and then, uh, you know, expansion of airports from the uh, metro to T1 cities. Coming on to the graph number three, which, which is uh, telling us the growth of investment numbers from 2020 to 2024 by, by nearly three times, so obviously, with no doubt, you know, renewable energy sector is driving all these sectors driven mainly by the solar energy with the main aim of achieving nearly about 500 gigawatts of installed capacity coming out of non-fossil fuels by 2030. So uh, in the uh, last subsector, which is utilities, which mainly covers the urban uh, infrastructure, the growth is mainly coming from the housing sector, projects uh, related to the piped uh, you know, drinking projects, drinking water projects, and natural gas projects coming under the city gas distribution projects. And last but not the least, you know, smart cities uh, projects are also driving the investments to provide the better amenities to the society. So, uh, with an aim to become a global economic powerhouse, strong infrastructure will be vital for the Indian economy. While, you know, as Gunjan said, while we are seeing an upward trend in the infrastructure investments, it is essential to ensure the sustainability of these initiatives. Because, you know, at times we see that government is announcing, let's say, this much billion of, uh, you know, dollars going into highways. But what matters is actual realization when it comes to, you know, uh, sustainability initiatives and other things revolving around the sector. Move to the next slide, please. Yes, so uh, we were discussing about you know, sustainability in the infrastructure sector. So we have, you know, divided, you know, various components in the infrastructure sector at the transportation and mobility level, which talks about highways, airports, railways, metros, and the dedicated ferry freight corridors, which are part of railway sector only. Energy, obviously the baseline is thermal, but the, you know, capacity additions are mainly coming because of solar, followed by wind. And other sectors, you know, the housing, the EV charging uh, the infrastructure, which is part of mobility and the ports. So, you know, both uh, uh, industry stakeholders and government 
they are actively working to enhance the sustainability by acknowledging the vital role of sustainable transportation and energy in reducing the environmental impacts while ensuring efficient mobility and equitable energy access for everyone so as far as you know transport infrastructure is concerned priorities are given to create the robust network that integrate various modes beat metros railways uh, or other transports to to meet the community needs when it comes to energy sector focus is no doubt on the low carbon economy through renewables upgrading the existing uh, transmission and distribution network to avoid the losses and investing in the clean coal technologies to reduce the emissions because as we said that that is the baseline although you know we are facing a lot of challenges related to the pollution because of coal energy or thermal power generation coming to the last uh, which is the social and utilities infrastructure the government aims to provide equitable access to essential services uh, while minimizing the environmental impacts through key initiatives like national mission for clean ganga uh, swachh bharat abhiyan then solid waste management policies which were rolled out in 2016 and pradhan mantri awas yojana and various others which are you know driving the roads access to rural areas as, as well so you know mapping all these initiatives and their associated investments as we said is is not that problematic which we have described in part number 2 on the right hand side but tracking the actual translation of allocated funds into capacity additions is challenging and this gap actually affects the adoption of sustainability across various sectors and to address this as again gunjan said we have developed a uk ibc in house model based on you know mlr which is multiple linear regression to forecast the capacity additions of highways railways housing sector and in the energy sector uh, sector cutting across solar wind and thermal sector come to the next slide please so here uh, on this particular slide what we have uh, in the first half of the slide we have given the output coming out of our model which is you know giving us the capacity additions for the highways so we have here a full year view starting from april 2024 till march 2025 so you know our our model gives us a flexibility to have a quarterly six monthly or a yearly view coming out of this this particular mlr based model now as far as you know whole sector is concerned you know india is currently having the world's second largest uh, road network spanning approximately 6.7 million kilometers and this this particular sector has seen nearly 60% increase in last one decade you know uh, part of this sector which is highways they have also seen nearly 65% increase expanding from 91000 kilometers in 2014 to nearly 163000 kilometers till 2023 end now growth in road infrastructure has significantly enhanced connectivity among cities towns villages and has important implication for economic growth which has obviously uh, you know increased the investments uh, you know improved the transport efficiency social dynamics also because the connectivity has improved uh, and all these details we have given in the below four boxes as a implication of this sector that commodities demand has increased be it you know steel or concrete or cement followed by an increased investment in this particular sector out of the 133 billion us dollars which has been you know allocated for the infrastructure sector nearly 33 billion has been assigned for the highways which is nearly nearly about 6% yoy increase and if we you know compare these numbers from 2014 they have grown by 500% now uh, you know our our logistics cost have uh, you know come down to 9% of total gdp obviously a long way to go when 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 compared to other uh, you know peer nations or developed nations and last but not the least you know everyone knows that you know this highways or construction sector they create a lot of you know employment opportunities as well coming on to the next slide please so here we have uh, you know talked about you know various initiatives which have been taken beat by the government or various stakeholders as far as you know sustainability is concerned so nowadays contractors and you know government is asking to use a lot of recycled material be it plastics or use of you know fly ash instead of soil in in the various stages of the project life cycle to minimize the you know environmental impact 
Renewable energy integration has become a critical aspect uh, in developing beat highways, bridges, and all these things. We have seen that how these uh, smart payment systems through to fast acts have, you know, uh, changed the whole movement across the highways. Improving designs, no doubt, uh, have uh, minimized the project cost, have improved the, you know, conditions, minimized the conditions over the highways, over the bridges and various critical points across the nation. And improving landscape practices have also, uh, which are very critical, have minimized the soil erosion or the landslide uh, related issues and improved the ground water level as well. Then uh, growing uh, focus on sourcing materials is also helping to achieve the sustainability uh, in the highways construction sector. Moving uh, to the next slide, please. So here we have talked about, uh, you know, railway sector. In the first half, we have given the output from the uh, our model, which is uh, taking into consideration various variables, uh, like uh, you can say the cross value add coming out of construction, steel pricing, rainfall to forecast the, uh, you know, railways capacity addition over the whole year. The time frame is same as we have discussed for the highways starting from April 2024 till March 2025. So here we are getting, you know, again, quarterly, six monthly and the whole year view. So, you know, as far as the sector growth is concerned, uh, I think in 2014 uh, on Pan-India basis, Government was able to add 3,500 kilometers or maximum 4,000 kilometers of railway tracks on an annual basis. But by 2023, this number has increased to 6,500 or 7,000 per year, reflecting that be it at the government level or at the department level, which is Indian Railways, commitment to expanding and strengthening the rail infrastructure to meet the growing demand is, is, is growing. Over the past decade, if we talk about, you know, per day increase in the capacity addition. So from 2014, uh, it was nearly four kilometer a day. And uh, till 2023-24, this number increased to 14.5 kilometer a day. You know, the amount of railways uh, tracks being added on, on a daily basis. So railway sector, uh, you know, because of all these points which we have mentioned above, the railway sector is going under a you know, lot of transformation marked by you know, sustainable investments and strategic initiatives taken by, by the government, be it related to the redevelopment of the stations as well, uh, aimed at enhancing the capacity, efficiency, and uh, you know, no doubt sustainability as well. So if we talk about implications, uh, definitely transportation costs because you know, major freight is being being uh, carried by railways only. Then regional development we have seen in past five, six, ten years that a lot of regional places and other places have been connected by railways, fostering, you know, obviously, you know, tourism and urbanization. And no doubt the real estate growth has also been supported by, by the railway uh, track laying or the sectoral growth. Move to the next slide. So here we have given some details uh, related to the, you know, sustainability initiatives taken at the railway sector level. So first and the most important one is no doubt the railway, uh, you know, track electrification, you know, moving away from the, you know, diesel locomotives to the, you know, electrification or the electric locomotives. This is some of the, is one of the key initiatives of the, of the, you know, this ministry or department. I think by, by 2024 uh, September, 90% of the railway track electrification has been achieved. And I think by end of next year, by 2025, this number will go up to, if not 100%, then maybe above 95%. Better signaling systems, again, important as we keep in mind, you know, recent accidents which have taken place in the Indian, uh, you know, at various uh, places you know, government has started focusing on the better signaling systems as well. Then obviously use of eco-friendly uh, materials, specifically in the passenger wagons, waste management initiatives, uh, bio toilets and water conservation, again, a critical aspect as far as, you know, sustainability is concerned. And as a land, you know, railways as a department holds a considerable land bank with, with them. So key drives are taken for the 
uh, you know, planting the trees and afforestation projects uh, to to take uh, down the greenhouse gas emissions related issues. Move to the next slide. Here we have talked about housing sector. Again, on in the first half, we have you know output coming from our model, giving us a view of the you know how much houses are being constructed uh, on a yearly basis, having you know uh, quarterly view, six monthly view, and annual view. Here we have you know different uh, you know variables which are going in to the model, starting from the home loan interest rates, you know gross value add from the construction. Uh, from uh, GDP quarterly uh, numbers as well, steel prices, rainfall, copper prices as well, because you know, and in uh, improving the efficiency of the buildings, copper also plays a very important role. So copper pricing is also going into this particular model. As far as you know, whole sector growth is concerned. Currently, you know, in India, nearly about one third of the total population is uh, living in the urban areas, and of the total, you know, 1.44 billion population. By 2030, another 600 million people are expected to, you know, uh, come to the urban areas, which is expected to drive the housing demand further in the in the coming years. As far as, you know, uh, investments uh, in the infrastructure inclusion is, is, is in concerned. I think housing sector is making all the positive strides going forward so as far as you know implications is concerned of this particular sector financial sector growth because you know banking sector uh, depends a lot on the housing sector growth uh, cement and uh, steel demand growth job creation as we said in the highway sector highways and this this housing sector they uh, you know both drive the job creation and the social impact as well because you know if the housing is provided to the larger population over overall the quality of life improves so these are the some of the key implications which we have mentioned in the bottom half of the projects next slide if we talk about you know some of the key initiatives which are taken uh, at the sustainability level then uh, you know use of uh, fly ash bricks in the projects uh, use of uh, you know pre engineered buildings uh, use of uh, you know high strength steel uh, to to expedite the work at the project size instead of you know concrete is is adding to the sustainability then green certifications you know if we talk about let's say 15 20 years back you know uh, builders or or the you know real estate developers they were not interested in 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 getting these green certifications but nowadays you know these these companies are marketing their products using these uh, you know green certifications that we have in place and clients are also asking for all these things smart uh, technologies or home automation are also you know increasing day by day in the in the projects just to improve the energy efficiency and uh, to uh, improve the security features as well in the in the housing sector then energy efficient device uh, you know designs are also coming into play uh, to to minimize uh, the heat impact and to improve the energy conservation water conservation in terms of rainwater harvesting and various other initiatives are also being taken by the government and also by the builders and you know key policy initiatives uh, by the government which includes pradhan mantri you know, uh, Avas Yojana is also driving this particular sector, if not at the metro level, but definitely at the tier one and tier two level and the village level. Now, I would like to hand over, uh, you know, uh, to Sakshi for the remaining slides. Over to you, Sakshi, please. Thank you, Shivraj. Uh, can we please go to the next slide? So as you can see on this slide, as per our in-house model, solar capacity addition is forecasted to grow at a fast pace in the upcoming years, with around 18,094 megawatts of solar capacity being added from April 24 to March 25, as you can see on the graph on the top of the slide. The Indian government has set ambitious targets aiming for 500 gigawatts of non-fossil fuel capacity by 2030 with a substantial portion of it coming from solar energy. 
with policies in place like the production linked incentive scheme and various state level schemes are designed to encourage solo manufacturing and deployment. The cost of technology has been declining rapidly, making solar energy more affordable and attractive, both for industrial projects as well as residential installations. As our economy continues to grow, the demand for energy is expected to rise with rising population, prompting a shift towards renewable sources to meet this demand sustainably. Increasing solar capacity addition in India has several significant implications across a variety of sectors. The first one being grid diversification and reliability. As you can see, the increasing capacities enhance grid reliability with 51 solar parks approved across India, totaling 37.74 gigawatts in 2023. The second point is that it has increased energy security and will further increase energy security. Uh, with our decreasing reliance on fossil fuels, we can enhance energy security. Currently, solar energy accounts for 20% of the total installed capacity and drives capacity addition. The third implication that uh, increasing solar power has that it has enabled supply of electricity to rural and remote areas, which has enhanced connectivity through internet access, thereby fostering development and improving uh, living standards. Lastly, like I mentioned earlier, the cost of average, the average cost of large scale solar projects in India has been declining. And uh, currently in Q1 2024, the cost decreased by 26% year on year. Can we go to the next slide? So since we understood how solar capacity addition is expected to increase and what can be the implications of increasing capacity addition, we now need to understand how is our country making significant strides in incorporating sustainability into its solar power initiatives. Some key strategies that the country is practicing is the introduction of innovative technologies wherein advanced solar technologies such as thin film solar cells, bifacial panels and floating solar farms are being used. Decentralization and storage with expanding residential and commercial installation in order to re reduce transmission losses and enhance local energy reliance. We have small scale independent systems in place and in order to boost the integration of energy storage systems to handle intermittent supply and improve reliability. Various government initiatives are also in place, such as uh, different subsidies are being provided, especially in rural areas, and users are being allowed to sell excess energy back to the grid through renewable purchase obligations, which are promoting more installations. Sustainable local manufacturing practices are being encouraged wherein the central government is implementing systems to recycle solar panels at the end of their life cycle and encouraging the use of locally manufactured solar panels to reduce the carbon footprint. Then we have community engagement. Periodic programs are being rolled out for educating people and creating awareness about the benefits of solar energy and sustainability. Then local communities are also involved in solar projects to ensure that benefits are widely shared. Lastly, we have environmental considerations, wherein solar projects are being planned to minimize the impact of agricultural land and biodiversity and proper disposal of the panels at the end of their life cycle and other waste generated during the solar project is promoted for encouraging environmental sustainability. Next slide. So uh, coming to like since we spoke about solar, we're coming to wind energy now. And uh, again, as you can see on the top of the slide that in according to our in-house model, wind capacity addition is forecasted to grow moderately in the upcoming years with 3190 megawatts of wind capacity being added from April 24 to March 25. India is set to add approximately 25 gigawatts of wind energy between FY25 and 28. 
this growth will be driven by the increasing need for renewable energy and grid balancing with supportive policies technological advancements and a strong commit and a strong commitment to renewable energy india is well positioned for significant increases in wind capacity addition in the coming years again this growth will contribute to a more sustainable energy landscape in the country as we can see that wind and uh, wind capacity addition is expected to significantly grow we have certain important implications across a variety of dimensions the first one being technological advancement boosting capacity additions and investments in wind energy can stimulate innovation in turbine resulting in more efficient and cost effective solutions then we have hybrid systems now when we have a variety of energy mixes in place it promotes grid stability as wind power supplements solar energy resulting in a more reliable energy supply then we have energy independence by harnessing wind energy in coastal areas which have the maximum potential and remote areas we can enhance energy security policy and regulation as wind capacity is seen to increase in the coming years we can see a stronger regulatory framework at place and policies that may be necessary to support wind power generation which currently lags behind solar next slide india is actively incorporating sustainability into its wind power initiative through several key strategies the first one being growing hybrid systems like i mentioned we have a increasing combination of solar and wind in providing a more stable energy supply by balancing the variability of each source hybrid systems optimize energy storage and energy generation reducing waste and maximizing output then a lot of innovation is being undertaken to improve the designs we are utilizing advanced aerodynamic designs that maximize energy capture while reducing noise and visual impact a lot of research and development is being undertaken on blades for making large turbines and coating materials is conducted locally to enhance turbine efficiency like shivraj mentioned we have various environmental impact assessments in place which are helping us to identify potential effects on wildlife ecosystems local communities which are allowing us to make more informed decisions and mitigation strategies then we have offshore capacity addition offshore wind farms harness stronger and more consistent winds than onshore ones leading to higher energy generation capacity government policies such as mandates for discoms to purchase a certain percentage of their power from renewable sources including wind through rpos guaranteed prices for wind power generation and waiver of interstate transmission charges are few policies that are encouraging adoption of wind energy lastly we have self reliance in manufacturing india has made significant strides towards self reliance in wind the country has developed the infrastructure and capability to build around 10 gigawatts of capacity of wind turbines per year next slide coming to thermal energy now as you can see on the top we have a graph and according to our in house model thermal capacity addition is forecasted to grow moderately in the upcoming years with 12601 megawatts of thermal capacity being added from april 24 to march 25 although there is a shift towards sustainability and you know renewable energy capacity thermal power still remains crucial for grid stability and meeting peak power demand during uh, seasons now india plans to add approximately 80 gigawatts of new thermal power capacity by 2032 to meet the rising electricity demand there was an interesting report by the central electricity authority that i was reading recently which spoke about 
how in order to meet the base load requirement by 2032 the installed coal and lignite capacity will need to reach 283 gigawatts from the current level of 217.5 gigawatts now increasing thermal capacity if you see has several significant implications across a variety of sectors we see that coal being our source we see there is an increase in coal consumption and in the coming years also we'll see that thermal power since it is largely dependent on coal will see an increase in consumption despite its environmental impact and rising costs second we have energy security and grid reliability expanding thermal capacity like i earlier mentioned will help meet the growing energy demands of a rapidly industrializing economy growing population ensuring a more stable energy supply as compared to renewables infrastructure development increased thermal capacity often leads to improvement in related infrastructure including transportation and logistics for fuel supply then we have stable transition of renewables there is a need for balancing thermal capacity with renewable energy investment and it is important for a sustainable energy future so i think the key here lies in bringing a balance between the traditional sources of energy and the renewable or the sustainable sources of energy that we have in place next slide please coming on to the uh, you know the need to you know incorporate sustainability into thermal power we have heavy reliance on coal and other fossil fuels however certain measures are being taken into account the first one being that there is adoption of efficient technologies uh, gencos or gen generation companies are utilizing high efficiency boilers and turbines to maximize energy output and reduce fuel consumption new capacity addition are being undertaken through supercritical thermal power plants and regular maintenance and optimization of existing infrastructure india is exploring carbon capture and storage technologies the union ministry of environment has recently initiated projects to assess feasibility of carbon capture and storage particularly in coal fired power plants to capture up to 90% of co2 emissions we are also installing scrubbers and filters to reduce pollutants another point is there is heat recovery systems wherein gencos are employing systems to capture and reuse waste heat that is generated that is generated during the power generation process which is helping in improving the overall efficiency then environmental management reducing water consumption we are reducing water consumption through closed loop cooling systems and we are recycling the waste water that is coming out particularly in water scarce regions reclaiming and rehabilitating mine sites and other disturbed areas to restore ecosystems is another practice that is being taken imported coal for blending while imported coal is utilized for supply stability it also offers a higher calorific value and lower ash content now improving power generation and efficiency minimizing waste international collaboration and policies collaborating with other countries to you know indulge in transfer of knowledge knowledge ex exchange technology and best practices in sustainable thermal power generation our government is currently working to implement carbon pricing mechanisms which can incentivize the adoption of lower carbon technologies next slide now moving on to how public private partnerships are vital for the infrastructure sector we see that ppps have come into play lately a lot and how it's benefiting our infrastructure sector now ppps are vital for easing the burden on the public sector or the government the first one that we the first point that we are talking about here is how there is an increased investment now if you can see ppps have attracted substantial private sector investment which has reduced the financial burden on the government it has facilitated construction of more highways 
like shivraj mentioned redevelopment of railway stations the addition of solar capacity and all while enhancing infrastructure quality one classic example of how it has reduced the financial burden on the government is the development of the indira gandhi international airport in delhi that involved a ppp model wherein private investor like gmr contributed to building and operating the airport the investment not only improved air facilities but also enhanced service quality reducing the need for public expenditure the second is we have better execution model in place now there are different models in ppp arrangements that provide flexibility in terms of financing design and operation we have models such as build operate transfer toll build operate transfer annuity and hybrid annuity model that have been employed to balance risk and reward between the public and private sectors one example of the build operate transfer toll model is the delhi gurgaon expressway which connects delhi to gurgaon it was developed under the bot model the project was awarded to a private consortium that was responsible for financing <clears throat> constructing and operating the toll road for a specific period of time before trans transferring back the ownership to the government the second uh, model that we spoke about was the hybrid annuity model and one example for that i think would be the bihar state highway project now the bihar state highway project was developed on this model and it involved the development and maintenance of several state highways now this model what it did was combine the elements of a traditional annuity based financing model and a public private partnership model ensuring that there is a balanced risk sharing between the government and the private players the third version is enhanced efficiency and speedy de delivery now if you see where private entities are involved there is a better you know project management practices that are taken care of and it also leads to a timely completion and improved maintenance of highway one such example can be of the gold, golden quadrilateral project which connects delhi mumbai chennai and kolkata and this project involved multiple private contractors from all these regions many segments of this project were completed ahead of schedule due to efficient planning and better execution by the private firms next is better maintenance now uh, public private partnerships often include maintenance and operation phases ensured ensuring that the infrastructure is not only built well but also maintained well over time one classic example would be the mumbai pune expressway which was constructed and is maintained by a private consortium under a ppp model the private entity is currently tasked with the long term maintenance of the expressway and they are employing modern techniques and technologies for regular upkeep second last point would be innovation now private partners bring a lot of advanced technologies and practices which enhance the quality and sustainability of infrastructure sector one such example can be of the delhi mumbai industrial corridor the dmic project aims to develop a high tech industrial zone along the delhi mumbai freight route private partners have introduced a lot of innovation into it such as smart city technologies integrated transportation systems energy efficiency then waste management solution and a lot of you know sustainability practices are also being taken into account such as use of renewable energy and green building practices is a core focus of Uh, the consortium in the delhi mumbai industrial corridor lastly risk sharing now in the public private partnership model like i mentioned earlier there is a more equitable distribution of risks between the public and the private sector which helps in mitigating you know potential financial losses one example of how you know the risk sharing is balanced between both the sectors is of the gujarat international financial tech city or the gift city now this is a smart city project which was developed through a ppp framework wherein the private sector was uh, involved in significant you know infrastructure development they invested significantly and hence the investment risk was borne by both the private sector and the government sector 
then the partnership also includes for a mechanism to share the operational risk and the revenue generation risk between both the sector ensuring that both public and private sectors have their aligned interest uh thank you and i think over to you shivraj yes thank you sakshi thank you for sharing the details specifically on the energy sector initiatives and on the ppc ppp side of the things where we have seen a lot of collaboration going on in between the government and the private sector with this we we have come to the end of this this presentation so uh if if uh, the attendees if you have any any questions then we are open to answer all these i i can see some questions coming from manish so manish i think uh, rightly said you know as far as you know comms infrastructure is concerned a long way to go you know uh, but definitely things have improved a lot as far as you know uh, in last 10 15 years uh, actually you know few of the subsectors of the infrastructure sector we have not considered for this particular webinar uh specifically you know telecom infrastructure then some of the things uh, like uh, you know capacity addition going in the city gas distribution projects uh, oil and gas pipelines so we 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 are still working on those particular sectors uh, which are part of energy side of things and uh, there are few other projects you know specifically you know the airport pro airport projects you know and then the, the port projects along with the agriculture sector as gunjan said so we are working on those things as well so if that is of interest definitely in the next series we can take up those you know topics and develop some insights on those as well Shivraj, there's another question from Harish. Um, he's yes. saying a lot of innovation solutions material available with startups and in universities R and D. Um, any support and collaboration uh, with industry and academia with startups? So definitely, Harish. You know, currently we are doing multiple engagements, uh, specifically, uh, you know, involving the Indian stakeholders, Indian companies, yeah, UK companies, and some some. uh you know government agencies as well from the both from both the sides where we are uh, you know uh, setting up the base and you know introducing the the innovators to the customers actually so i can discuss this with you separately uh to take this forward chris you wanted to come in Yeah, yeah. Just, just on that point, just to mention, you know, and as it sort of bring that to, to life as an example for that, we work with um, uh, obviously lot, lots of companies. But one of the companies we're working with is looking at its total global uh, sort of aims towards net zero, and as part of that, it's actually looking at new innovation in terms of bottling and glass. So we're actually looking at. research and development and new opportunities within the glass industry so perhaps the moving to hydrogen for the furnaces or looking at new technologies in glass production um to make that easier so that's where we're trying to look at universities innovators in india to solve that challenge just wanted to sort of try to bring that to life a bit and to add on to that uh, harish we have we also have at this moment currently we are working with a cohort of uh, uk based uh, smes and they're mostly into the energy and uh, you know sustainability solution uh, sector and we are helping them connect with uh, indian stakeholders it could be end users collaborators uh, you know core developers in technology so we are doing a lot of uh, if you will matchmaking in this uh, sec segment so You know, feel free to write to us with your specific queries, and we'll we'll be happy to help you with that. Any more questions? 
Bhaskar has a question on future session details. So I think surely, you know, look out for our social media channels for that. We'll, we are very interested to do these webinars very, very often. So just stay in, um, um, follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter, and you will know of these updates very soon. So I think um, that's about it. Um, if we don't have any more questions, um, Gunjan, would you like to just um, give a few closing remarks? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Trisha. And thank you, Shivraj uh, uh, Sakshi, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you all for attending and you know giving us your time to listen to us. And a uh, uh, huge thanks to our events team who has helped uh, us to uh, materialize this webinar. And uh, this is, as we said, this is the, one of the first session in one of a series of webinars that we're going to present. And uh, with this, we'd like you to, you know, share if you have any ideas on what topics you'd like us to cover. If you have any recommendations, please do feel free to write to us and you know we'll be happy to take those suggestions and comments forward and uh, we hope to see you soon in our next session uh, thank you so much everyone thank you